Thank you very much, Walter. Uh, by the way, uh, the reason I'm, I'm here today is uh, uh, about a year ago, Walter and uh, Stefan uh, Romani of Australia uh, asked if uh, uh, we start reaching out to the, the diaspora and filling them in. Uh, their feeling was that a lot of people, while they follow the general uh, events, were not aware uh, of much of the aspects of the war. Uh, so I, I did that in uh, Australia, but I think uh, met with uh, seven different uh, groups, um, and now, now we've done it probably about uh, 18, 20 times uh, here in the United States. This is the first time in Canada, but I'm all happy to, uh, to do that uh, and, um, and inform uh, groups uh, wherever, wherever we can. Uh, first slide, please. How do we get into to this? I'm not Ukrainian, though I was adopted by a elderly German couple who traced their roots as German Mennonites back to Zaporozhia uh, for a couple hundred years. So uh, it was interesting. Uh, part of a, this, uh, this adventure has been to discover my own uh, uh, adopted family, family roots. The Potomac Foundation, which I'm uh, president and helped start uh, about 28 years ago, uh, had uh, ran over a thousand training sessions for former Warsaw Pact countries and Soviet republics. And uh, some Ukrainians had attended those. Well, after Yanukovych fled, uh, the new interim government reached out to us and asked if we would put together a training seminar. They were going to bring over a half dozen of their new leaders like uh, Perubi um, and others and a half dozen of their senior general officers to run a training session like they'd seen us do before for other, NATO, for other countries aspiring to be part of NATO. Uh, so I reached out to uh, General Clark, uh, been a friend for a long time and uh, asked him if he would uh, like to participate. I wanted to do it as a, uh, as a bipartisan thing. As you know, he was Supreme Allied Commander of NATO in 2004, American Democratic uh, presidential candidate. Uh, at least at the time, I thought I was a Republican. I'm not sure what I am today. <laughs> uh, and the two of us were in, in Kiev for about a week. When we arrived, the U.S. Ambassador told us that the uh, Ukrainian Armed Forces uh, were struggling. Uh, they'd put in a show for a couple days and probably uh, call it quits. Uh, we tried to find out what was going on. Uh, our uh, mil uh, military attaches and intelligence people were forbidden by the President of the United States to go east of the Dnieper. Uh, so we and most NATO uh, countries did not have any people at the front. After we'd been there about a week, Clark says, okay, I'm going to see the President of Rom Romania, President of France, uh, General Brelove, uh, President Obama, which he did. By the way, he ruined his relationship with President Obama, uh, repeatedly making the case for uh, uh, arming Ukraine. And people ought to know that, what a, a enormous effort he personally made uh, to try and help the country. Uh, he said, well, I'm, I'm going to do that. We've got to get to the front, so uh, tag, you're it. So I put together a team and started going to uh, figure out what was going on. Next slide. Well, that's where it's been. Um, now it's been about 180 days total at the, at the front. Next slide. Uh, the, uh, and I was there when the Ukraine was mobilizing during Ukraine's uh, summer offensive to try to uh, free the, the uh, Donbass. Uh, then in the horrific uh, winter offensive, uh, six weeks. Um, I hate fighting any time, but uh, fighting in the winter when uh, everything doesn't work uh, is uh, unbelievable. Uh, the suffering those troops did in that winter offensive. Uh, every day I lost somebody I knew. Uh, nobody has, has an appreciation of what those uh, kids went through that winter when the Russians attacked six places. Uh, and almost, almost uh, into the war. Uh, uh, sometimes I carry a, a weapon. It's not to be play Rambo. I still don't be taken alive. Uh, managed to get uh, get hit with some uh, Russian artillery, so I brought a little bit of uh, from Russia with love back in my in my arm. Next slide. Uh, more recently, uh, General Mushenko, Chief of the General Staff, has had me uh, working with uh, many of his senior leaders. He's trying to bring up a whole new generation of uh, young uh, combat commanders, and that's basically probably the main thing I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but also brought U.S. Army as a new appreciation. Uh, the uh, Chief of the Army and the current National Security Advisor to the uh, uh, U.S. President, uh, General McMaster, uh, put together a team led by General Jones up in the upper right-hand corner, uh, and myself to, for the U.S. Army to go to Ukraine. So we're standing at the battlefield of uh, Slovyansk, and I was uh, showing him uh, the battle I'd observed. Also, General Brelov uh, uh, came with me. Uh, you'll hear a lot about uh, uh, Zabrowski and Sotol. Those are the two generals flanking uh, uh, Brelov and, my, uh, and myself. Next slide. Uh, five messages today. This war is not over, and most people do not realize the extent of the violence and the cost to Ukraine. Yes, the maneuver stage is down, and yes, the casualties per day are down, but the cumulative effect is actually very large. Uh, 
the Russian threat has been going, has been growing. This is probably one of the most important points I want to get across to you today, because Ukraine needs your help. The argument by Western countries, particularly Merkel and uh, others, uh, in fact, I've heard this in Canada, is, well, we don't want to arm Ukraine because that would just stimulate an arms race and then uh, things would get worse. So NATO has it. The most effective sanction of this war has not been the economic sanctions against Russia. It has been a total and complete embargo on any lethal aid by anybody to Ukraine. We are punishing the victim of aggression by not letting them rearm. But while we said we weren't going to do that so that it wouldn't make things worse, the Russians have been building up. And I'll show you some of that extent. And that, that argument is now fraudulent. And, and it, people need to be called on it, and it needs to be corrected. Ukraine's military is getting stronger. Anybody who's associated with Ukraine ought to be proud of it. There's a whole new generation of these young combat commanders. And as I said, I'm going to tell you a couple of their stories today. Uh, another canard. Uh, Ukraine is sort of viewed as the beggar. Oh, please, give us a little bit of weapons, maybe a javelin. Oh, and if we're really good, you pat us on the head 30 years from now, maybe we can join NATO. It's not time to stop being humble. It's time to stop begging. NATO needs Ukraine as much as Ukraine needs NATO, and people need to realize that. So those are my key messages, and I think we could quit and probably hit the bar if you like. Uh, uh, <laughs> the rest is just the rest is just uh, 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 making some of the points. Next slide, please. So this is measuring violence. If it's on that slide, we know where it occurred, we know the size it occurred, we know the exact date and who the participants were. So every day there is violence going on in Ukraine. So you look at this histi histogram, in the early days, yeah, the takeover of, uh, of Crimea and the Donbass was relatively low in violence, and the Ukrainians did their counteroffensive. Then the Russians, which was called Plan B, because uh, Plan A was wait for the Western allies to uh, negotiate with Russia to back off, which didn't work. Uh, Russians then launched their uh, summer offensive, uh, came within uh, literally 24 hours and probably one guy. Uh, of losing the war in that summer offensive. Uh, then there was the Minsk 1 ceasefire, which failed, uh, slowed down over the Christmas holidays, and then the Russians pulled out a, a full uh, six prong aggression in the winter offensive. Again, then a recommitment to the ceasefire values called Minsk 2, uh, and periodic uh, uh, battles. Since the winter offensive, uh, both sides have dug in. So there's a lot of artillery exchange. But the, uh, but the maneuver and the actual number of casualties are, are, are low. B but remember, this Ukrainian army has now been in the field fighting for 45 continuous months. They have shot more ammunition than exists in all of NATO's stockpile on the continent of Europe today. <laughs> How long can they keep it up? They've had 10,000 dead, 40,000 seriously wounded, close to 2 million displaced. How long, how long are they expected to hold on? If there's any doubts about Russian fingerprints in this, look at where it dips. When the Russians uh, uh, came to the, to the west, the United States said, oh, please help us uh, uh, prop up uh, the Assad uh, 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 regime in Syria. All of a sudden, the violence drops. We're all going to be friends and security partners. And then when the West didn't like the idea of backing a mass murder, bang, up it goes again. So that's, that is the real war. That is the war that the Ukrainian army every day is, is facing. Next slide. The Russians uh, have, a lot of people call it hybrid war. They use the, the Russians use the term hybrid war to describe what we do. Uh, but their term of art is called new generation war. So yeah, there's the hybrid stuff at the lower end. But remember, the Crimea uh, invasion wasn't just a takeover. It was the most successful large-scale uh, helicopter air assault in recorded history. A direct conventional invasion. 
Then they took the number three and four men who had organized the, uh, the political aspects in Crimea, moved them to the Donbass, and they started the subversion campaign in the proxy war. But it looked like they were losing, then the Russians intervened both in August and then massively again in, uh, in the winter offensive. Today there's uh, 40,000 combatants approximately, it varies four or 5,000 depending on time of year and so forth, in the Donbass opposing Ukraine. About uh, 10,000 or a quarter of them are Russian, a Russian military, actual Russian military officers. In fact, almost all the units are uh, uh, commanded by, uh, by uh, senior Russians. There's two corps uh, and a total of nine uh, Russian-style brigades, all manned and led by Russians. Of the remaining 30,000, only about 20 of those thousand are really from the Donbass. Another 10 to 15 uh, are mercenaries, uh, Chechens, uh, other people uh, who've come in and are getting paid to uh, participate in this uh, hybrid campaign. What most people don't realize is that from the beginning, from the night Russia went into Crimea, this has been uh, added nuclear overtones. Putin put on strategic alert his strategic rocket uh, submarines uh, out in, at sea. Uh, an extremely high state of alert. He's made direct nuclear threats against, um, against Ukraine. They've now moved Russian nuclear weapons into Crimea. So there's an aspect of very heavy threat. So we're all talking to pull our hair out about North Korea acting weird, uh, but there's been an aspect that basically goes unseen. And then of course the other side is uh, uh, always the uh, willingness to sit down and negotiate on their terms and set up uh, fake uh, ceasefires. Next slide. Ukraine is not the only place that this is being applied to. It just happens to be the one case where all five of those dimensions of new generation war are in active play. Next slide. Now this is a very busy slide for people who aren't uh, military. Now, let me just explain it for a second. Each of those little smaller units, a, a circle, a square, or triangle, are a brigade size unit. If it's red, it has been introduced. It didn't exist in the end of 2013. It has been introduced since the beginning of this war. If it's orange, it means it's been reorganized, increased manpower, increased weapons. That is a hell of a threat aimed at Ukraine, but also NATO. At the end of the Cold War, the Russians had five armies in East Germany. First Guards tank, second Guards tank, third shock, eighth guards, the 20th. At the end of the Cold War, they, they pulled them back, and only one of those remained, the 20th. Well, they're back. So the 20th has been moved from Moscow down to Voronezh. The First Guards tank army is back, which can swing to Kiev or to NATO. Back in the Urals, the second army is being converted back to a tank army. The Eighth Guards army has been recreated. And the Russians have now brought back the term gar, uh, shock army, so we may see that one come as well. Next slide. So there's a range of threats against Ukraine. They could just drive and create, have a small operation to allow of Azov to create a land bridge to Crimea, which they need because Crimea really depends on 80% of its uh, uh, water used for agriculture from the mainland. There is no substitute. You can build a bridge across the Kirk Straits, but you can't replace that water. Uh, or they could make an attack in the middle, or they could go all the way. In the Second World War, after the Battle of Kursk, the Russians had a three-stage plan. They started in the south and stretched the line, hit the center, and then when they hit Kiev, they went all the way to Lviv. By the way, we found copies of that war plan uh, uh, that actually had been delivered in, into the uh, command in the Donbass. Next slide. The Ukrainian army started the war with 15 brigades. They lost one in Crimea, then they lost several during the war. But they only had 10 battalions that were actually ready to fight. Because that army had been neglected for, for 20 years. Uh, the, uh, the units that were considered ready had only 60% of their manpower and less than 50% of their equipment could even drive out of the gates. The, uh, 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 there were a thousand, airplane, a thousand airplanes, billions of dollars worth of fighters. Hadn't been flown in 10 years and most of them are still sitting there because they don't have the money to repair them and, and make them operational. It was one of the most uh, criminal neglects of a military establishment uh, in modern time. But they're back. So now they have 66 combat trained, 100,000 troops right now in that army have combat experience. A whole new uh, series of uh, leaders and they got 22 brigades. They want to go to 30 brigades, they just don't have the equipment to outfit them. One of the big problems is they've lost so much equipment. So they, the good news is they'd inherited a lot of old Soviet junk that had been sitting around. That's why they could even stay in this war as long as they have. 
but they're now reaching back not to 1980s equipment, but to 1960s equipment. Well, you can't get spare parts because the Russians won't, won't sell it. You drive to the front and after 200 kilometers, uh, it breaks. The engine pops, the, uh, the fluids run out, the tires uh, go out. So they desperately need now to, to uh, get some new equipment to uh, replace these uh, very large losses. Next slide. This is the Ukrainian army today. It's concentrated in the Donbass, trying to cover these other threat areas, but 2,000 kilometer frontage, uh, which is an enormous amount to try and, and, uh, and hold. Next slide. So the Russians have some inherent weaknesses. At the end of the Cold War, the Russians had 5 million men under arms, uh, 210 divisions. Uh, today, but today, they have only uh, a million men under arms. Uh, they have 88 brigades, but half of them are manned with uh, uh, more than 50% draftees. The draftees are treated poorly. They're not well trained. When they put them in combat, um, they don't do well, and they take high, high casualties, and their mothers get very angry at the political. But so since Putin's been in, since 1999, the Second Chechen War, uh, they have not committed draftees to either uh, the Chechen War, Georgia, or Ukraine. They go, go out of their way not to send draftees into these uh, conflicts. Uh, they have these new formations, but they're not completely ready and so forth. Next slide. There is a whole new generation of guys you need to know. But even more important, your kids need to know them. Your grandkids need to know. And you need to know what they did and how they did it. And I think if you take the time to educate yourselves and the, the global diaspora, you'll have a new appreciation of what it means to be Ukrainian. And you're no longer just the ones who everybody kicks around. You can fight back. You have fight. Uh, you have fought back, and these are the guys that did it. So I'm going to talk about Zabrowski, the one that's telling us to breed love. Uh, just a couple others. Uh, Kravachu held the Luhansk airport for a hundred days. In the end, the Russians overran the position, but his guys fought back and stripped the infantry out from the Russian tanks. So as the Russian tanks drove through the airport, all of a sudden they were being uh, hit by uh, the airborne from the back. So you actually had a scene where Russian tanks are withdrawing and running away, being chased on foot by, by Ukrainian uh, airborne guys firing handheld rocket launchers because that's all they had. Now the Russians got them back a couple days later. They hit it with thermobaric strike and, and massive uh, artillery. Uh, in the end, Kravachuk uh, pulled out. He was wounded, uh, and 75% of his 180 guys that were left were wounded. Uh, but the Russians wouldn't even walk into the place for three days because they were afraid that the Ukrainians were, were still there. Uh, Krivinos held uh, Kramatorsk airport for 80 days surrounded. They ran out of ammunition, they ran out of water, but they would not give up. Uh, Bakulin. Uh, took Donetsk Airport, Special Forces, and also Tsar Magulov. At Tsar Magulov, the largest mound in southern Ukraine, the largest hill, you can see, it was a very famous battle in World War II, there was a huge Russian statue on it. And you can see for 40 kilometers around, so it's a strategic point. Tsar Magulov changed hands eight times. First the Ukrainians grabbed it, and the Russians. Ukrainians grabbed it, back and forth. Golachuk was the last commander. Finally, uh, and by the way, virtually everybody on either side who held it did not survive. Horrific artillery bombardment and then brutal hand-to-hand -hand, uh, combat with uh, no, no surrender, no, no prisoners. He's trying to evacuate his guys and artillery hits him and blows the back of his cranium off. He's laying in a pile of bodies for two days. Red Cross comes along picking up the bodies as they turn him over. Part of his cranium, part of his brain was falling out of the back of his head. He moaned. Uh, brought to here in the United States, uh, at, uh, United States uh, and uh, today is uh, back in uniform and uh, leading one of the academies. Uh, 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 Mikas defended the Donetsk airport 
and literally slaughtered a full regiment of uh, Russian airborne in their various battles. In the end, Donetsk airport couldn't be held, but the, the cost the Russians paid for it, it was enormous. You can go on Google Earth, go to Pishikov, northern Russia, next to uh, Estonia, and look at the base and look at their cemetery and, and actually see the hundreds of new graves uh, that uh, were dug because of, uh, of uh, the, the fight at uh, Donetsk airport. So what I'm going to tell you about a little bit is uh, Zabrowski. By the way, why I'm going to tell you about it? Because uh, yesterday he was named as the new commander of the uh, ATO, the anti-terrorist uh, uh, operation in the Donbass. So he's the guy who's now running the war. And I think you ought to, ought to have an appreciation of, uh, of this guy. Next slide. A little bit of his background. Next slide. I first met him. His unit was one of, one of the very few that was even considered uh, ready. And I first met him uh, in March of 14 on the Crimean uh, Peninsula. We're sitting there on the causeway. And I'm looking through the artillery glasses and I, I can see a couple of Russian uh, heavy artillery battalions, tank battalion, lots of infantry. And I turn to him, I go, uh, do you have, uh, next slide, do you have, uh, do you have uh, mines out on this uh, 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 causeway? And he says, well, the United States paid us to get rid of our anti-tank mines, so all they have is a few uh, uh, infantry uh, anti-tank mines. I said, what do you have for anti-tank uh, weapons? You got some tanks, uh, heavy anti-tank guided missiles? He says, no, we're light guys, we're airborne, we're like air guys. He you know? said, uh, we have an RPG-26. I go, I know, and I mean, a real weapon. No, no, we're light guys. So what do you have for artillery? So he beams, he takes me over, he says, hey, we got uh, four of these automatic mortars, which are great, great system. Look, four of them, and they're 82 millimeter. I'm looking at probably 50 Russian tubes of MLRS and heavy artillery across them. And I turn to him, and I go, how, how long can you hold this position? And he looked back, and he smiled and said, to the last man. To the last man. Now, the Russians didn't come across. Next slide. So next, the, the Ukrainians go on the offensive in uh, July 4th of 14, uh, after repeated efforts to try to negotiate. And the separatists had Slavyansk, which had been one of the major centers, and was large uh, uh, Russian and the separatist units. And they were expecting a, a direct frontal attack. Instead, next slide. And by the way, that's uh, uh, Krivinos holding the uh, Kramatorsk down there uh, on the, uh, that airbase. Uh, Zabrowski and uh, Sotl swing around unexpectedly and hit the uh, hit them from the back and the rear, they have then abandoned Slovia, Slovians and left literally warehouses full of ammunition. When they, when they separatists get back to uh, Donetsk, uh, they go to the Russian commander who was really angry because they had fled, and, and, and he said uh, uh, they demanded to get paid. He said, we're not going to fight anymore unless we get our new, our new pay. He said, you idiots, you left. The, the money is in a safe in Slovians. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> During the summer, Ukraine was trying to do three things. They were trying to secure the border, they were trying to retake territory, and then they wanted to split uh, the two republics, the Donetsk and, people, and uh, Luhansk People's Republic. By the way, there's a reason those are called People's Republics. Because they look, feel, and smell like North Korea. <laughs> I've only been behind the lines three times. Once we were overrun down at Novosorisk by Russian tanks, a second, uh, Took a wrong turn in a rainstorm, which was interesting. Uh, but but, but only, only once uh, intentionally, to, and I had a chance to interview some of the resistance guys from the Donetsk crowd. And I won't take the time now, but, but the stories they tell about essentially a descent of a Stalinist regime there, with Babuska sitting in the back of every classroom reporting on people. Same thing happening in any, any uh, workers' uh, uh, group. Um, it, it is dark and getting darker uh, there in terms of uh, a human, any human decency and liberty. So the problem was, given the amount of force they had, the Ukrainians were basically trying to take on too much. As the Russians were able to, to infiltrate and, and support and get more and more weapons into the, uh, the separatists, and then the Russians moved massive amounts of artillery along the border and started firing across. So the US and NATO was giving uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainians uh, some intelligence, but we said, you do, don't you dare use that intelligence to fire at Russia. That would be attacking the home power, the, the homeland of a superpower. Oh, we can't do that. But we just think about that message if you're Estonian, Latvian, right? Um, so we were giving them delayed intelligence. So they didn't really see the uh, subsequent events uh, in a timely way. In the course of this, the Russians hit a uh, Ukrainian unit at Savannah in the middle of the night. 
It had just, they had been told, oh, the Russian uh, unmanned aerial vehicles don't have uh, infrared, so they can't see you, so if you drive at night. Uh, by the way, our, our intelligence believed that until we started bringing the truth back. Uh, but the Russians had seen them. They pulled into a position, and the Russians hit them with a very heavy uh, artillery and thermobaric. Thermobaric weapon is like napalm on steroids. When it, just a piece of it hits you, it, it will not go out until it burns down to the bone. The commander was killed. Uh, uh, two mechanized battalions were essentially uh, uh, made combat ineffective. The medical staff was burnt on. I later taught, interviewed the deputy commander and he said, uh, we have to invent a new level of triage. I go, what's that? He said, the first level is, is when somebody comes up and they're on fire begging you to shoot them, do you do it to take them out of their misery? So these guys are getting beat up and there's uh, three, equipment, three Ukrainian brigades, uh, thousands of guys caught now between the separatists and the Russian border. And, and they're licking their chops waiting to to, uh, they can't get ammunition, they can't get wounded out. Next slide. So, Zabrowski and General Muzhenko come up with a plan. They put, General Solda takes his, his uh, uh, brigade and cuts a corridor into the heart of the separatists. And then Zabrowski hits it like a hot knife through butter. Now remember, this is a guy who didn't have any heavy equipment back on Crimea. When he took Slavonsky, he had a company of tanks, a couple of batteries of artillery. Now he's got a full battalion of tanks, his troops are mounted on infantry fighting vehicles and he's got two full battalions of artillery. He hits that running, drives down, takes Sarbagula, he's got to cross the Mias River. Well, on the way there, his bridging had got shot up, so they're laying the bridging down across the river. Our Russian artillery is uh, uh, coming all in and around it, and they're two bridge lengths too short to get across. So what do you do? So guys go across the other side, they start chopping down trees, shoveling dirt into it, and the river's running too fast and just carries it all away. In the end, they put 35 civilian cars into the river to stabilize it so they could actually put the, the bridging on top of those uh, cars and got across. Drove in, saved the uh, units, saved the guys, and then cut all the way across country back to um, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine Air territory. The largest and longest armored raid in recorded history behind enemy lines. Not just in, in Ukraine, in recorded military history, conducted by an airborne guy who originally didn't even have any tanks. Next slide. Late August 14, the Russians come across very hard. That's the battle at Luhansk I was telling you about with Kravachuk. In the south, the Ukrainians had brought the 51st Brigade from uh, uh, north of, uh, of uh, Lviv, uh, and they were made up of reserves. They just arrived. They didn't have a single anti-tank weapon that would penetrate the Russian uh, tanks because the Russian tanks are covered with this new reactive armor. The Russians hit them, their anti-tank weapons just bounce off. Russian artillery is, is uh, hitting very hard, their commander's killed, and they got scared and jumped in, a bunch of them jumped in their cars and left, ran home. Now you can call them traitors, you can call them cowards, but throwing unprepared troops into that maelstrom with inadequate weapons, is like what happened to us at Task Force Smith or any number of, in Korea, 1950, or any number of, of losing uh, battles. But that left a huge gap in the front. The volunteers were fighting there at Ilyvice, the, the middle of the lower three uh, boxes. Russians surround them uh, and start just smearing them with uh, artillery. Putin, ever the humanitarian, offers a exit route. He says, you leave your heavy weapons, you can take this route and, uh, and, 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 and withdraw. So they line up, columns 10, 15 kilometers long. They're carrying 300 Russian prisoners because they take better care of Russian, uh, uh, Russian wounded because they take better care of Russian wounded than Russians do. And they're on this road. And then the Russians start at one end and the other with artillery and thermobaric fire and just walk the entire road. So Browski had been ordered to come down uh, but, and it took him 24 hours. By the time he gets down there, uh, they're gone. By the way, the Russians had also promised they would not turn them over to the, sep to, uh, the prisoners to the separatists, but they did. And the separatists then took a, a, a 70 of these kids to the hospital in, in Donetsk and castrated them. And, uh, and then, then repatri repatriated them later. About a third of those kids have since uh, committed suicide. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So Zabrowski is about halfway down. Ilyevsk has fallen. He's got one brigade, and he's facing the re massive Russian breakthrough. I ask him. I ask him the same thing. Um, I asked the Israeli general after the '73 war on the on the Golan, uh, when when he uh, the Syrians had a couple divisions, and he took one understrength brigade and hit him from the flank. And I go, why didn't you defend? And the Israeli general said, I didn't have enough to force to defend. I had to attack to throw them off their game plan. And that's what Zabrowski did. So he cuts across their rear area, overrunning the command and control, overrunning their artillery. I was at uh, Mariupol at that point. Mariupol was surrounded. He gets down to Mariupol, rearms, refuels, goes back halfway up, and turns east directly into the Russian attack. Hits them hard, crosses a river, takes his town, puts his artillery in the middle of it. By the way, uh, Zabrowski was trained at uh, Fort Leavenworth, and, and in the earlier raid, I'd ask him, uh, why did you get the idea for this raid? And he said, oh, I studied uh, Jeb Stewart's ride behind McClellan in the American in the Civil War and the Peninsula Campaign. I thought it was cool. I thought we ought to try it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm asking him, so, you, so he then splits his forces. Half of them going one way, half going the other with his artillery in the center. And I go, you know, the last guy I remember who cut his forces in half was Custer. And it didn't work out so well for him. <laughs> and, he, and he looked back, he smiled, he said, I ha if, if I stayed still, they would surround me. If I stayed as a single unit, uh, they, I, they would, would, would end up being able to block us. So he said, I, I, I had to uh, keep moving and keep them in the reactive mode. I subsequently talked to his uh, subordinate commanders. And uh, in the meeting, when he lays out the plan, ended like this. He lays out the plan and says, I'll meet you back here in 96 hours or at the gates of Valhalla. Not one of those commanders thought they were coming back. No. The courage that takes, the willingness to take that kind of risk uh, with such an uncertain outcome. Uh, is enormous. Uh, as it turned out, <laughs> they stopped the offensive. And Zabrowski and his guys came back with more equipment than they had entered. They, when they hit Russian tank units from the back, the guys jumped out of the tanks and ran and left the engines still running. <laughs> I've been in, the, in one of the tanks that, that I've driven one of the tanks. He, in fact, there was a picture of me on a, on a tank earlier. That was me in, a, in one of the tanks he brought back from, uh, from the Russian. Next slide. Uh, later in the uh, summer of uh, 15, the Russians are preparing a classic breakthrough. This is General Mikas is defending uh, Donetsk, and he and Zabrowski do it. Now, this time the Ukrainians see it coming. Next slide. So Ukrainians bring their artillery in, but they don't use them until the attack starts. And when it did, they smeared them. They literally destroyed, decimated an entire separatist uh, brigade, and the Russian second echelon wasn't even committed. It's a classic Zabrowski. All these are Zabrowski quotes. In general, we need to know only about the enemy, that he's not dumber than we are, and that he is technically superior to us, that his blood is also red, and he also dies. Next slide. Joe Brinklow and I were spent quite a bit of time with uh, Zabrowski. This is his evaluation because of what he's doing with the airborne forces. Next slide. This is Zabrowski. He's been invited to the United States three times, uh, organized by the Potomac Foundation for the US Army. Uh, 1,400 U.S. Uh, senior officers, including uh, a half dozen four-star generals sitting there in rapt attention. You know, people talk about, oh, we're going to train the Ukrainians. Every U.S. officer I've talked to comes back and says, we're learning more from them than, than they are from us. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, I started, when I started going around Ukraine, I wanted to leave something behind, so I started bringing the uh, Don't Tread on Me American flag, which was designed by a U.S. Marine in, uh, 18, in 1775, during our revolution. Uh, and then I thought it would be kind of cool to put it on a Ukrainian flag and put the words in, in Ukrainian. By the way, the, the troops love these. Um, anybody would like to contribute to flags, let me know. I'll just tell you how to do it. They, they, they love having this. They wear the flags. And by the way, after d the Battle of Debalsova, it was a very tough battle. Ukrainians lost 100 tanks, 200 uh, ar artillery pieces, 250 ar armored personnel carriers, and 700 vehicles in one battle. By the way, it's more equipment than is in all the active NATO units today in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Germany in one battle. 
But afterwards, uh, the guys went into the ball so, uh, and, and were uh, uh, showing their flag off. Next slide. So you look at, here's NATO's uh, brigades. These are the Russian armies. Uh, if it's white, they're not ready. If they're blue, they're kind of marginal. And you look at that map and you go, who wouldn't want the Ukrainians on our side? It's nuts. Next slide. So, why does the violence continue? Because France and Germany, which were the, uh, along with Putin, the uh, ne uh, negotiators of the Minsk Agreement, have refused to basically recognize that it's being violated routinely every day. You would need three or four thousand peacekeepers to observe that ceasefire, and there's only three or four hundred OSCE people. Uh, much of the territory on the Donbass was agreed that the OSC wouldn't go into without advance warning, which is, which by the way, wasn't applied on the Ukrainian side. The Russian threat is growing against NATO and Ukraine. It's not because it's a return to the Cold War in the sense of this massive Russian army. They are making major buildups, but they're really hurting on particular manpower. It's because we in the West have been too weak. Ukraine's military is getting stronger. They have the quantity, but the, the quality is, it, it, what, the replacement equipment is, is in bad shape. And they need, they can't get spare parts from Russia. They need help from the West. As I said, there's this whole new generation, battle-hardened commanders. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the reform community in particular about, oh, well, you know, we have these old Russian generals. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and criticism in the army. And I think it's really misplaced. I honestly do. As much time I've spent with the Ukrainian army, the army and the general staff, I've seen virtually no corruption. I'm not saying there isn't corruption in Ukraine. I'm not saying there's isn't corruption in the ministries and in, in the armament crowd. But in the army, it's, these guys, it's they and their troops that are fighting and dying. Uh, and, and they're not stealing stuff. And they're not going to tolerate anybody who does. Why am I stressing that? Because as part of this reform movement, there's a, a, a tendency to, to, if a mistake is made, if a risk is taken and it doesn't work out, to then actually scream for their heads. Including, in some cases, bringing them into, uh, 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 guys who made some really tough decision into civilian court and bringing them under trial. And that's wrong. But just, we wouldn't do that. Because uh, 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 what does it do? It robs your commanders of the very thing that, 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 that is the most notable uh, improvement in the last uh, 45 months, is the willingness to take risk, the willingness to put the other side on the, other, uh, on the, on the defensive. Next slide. Almost done. So if you sort of look at it, if you look worrying about security in, in Eastern Europe, there's essentially two centers of gravity. One centered on Poland and the Baltic, and the other centered on Ukraine and the, and the uh, Black Sea. It's the long and short of it. Next slide. Again, Zabrowski. But what we need more than any weapon is the knowledge that we will not be abandoned. Now, I know that the diaspora hasn't abandoned Ukraine. But I don't know that the Ukrainian military feels that the diaspora has the appreciation of what they've been through. I'm not criticizing anybody, but I would ask you, as we talk about the way forward, think of ways to show that appreciation. As was said last night, we're past the period of sending things. Now it's, it's action. Next slide. So here's some suggestions. Unfortunately, there's a, a, a military uh, lethality package sitting on president, uh, the American president's desk. It's been sitting there for two months, approved by, pushed by General McMaster, approved by Secretary of State uh, Tillerson and uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis, but it's sitting there. Uh, since the new government came into Australia, I'm not criticizing anybody, but I think you would agree, the support for Ukraine has changed, has, has, has not been nearly as evident as the previous administration. Um, and here in Canada, people are very strong, but over and over, I hear the words, oh, well, we, we, we just want to support Ukraine economically, we'll train, maybe help, but you know, lethal aid, we don't want to make things worse. And those of you Canadians who hear that, I would appreciate. I think I, 
uh, uh, that you, you spend some time and, and see what's actually happened, that in fact the Russians, when we aren't helping Ukraine, the Russians are building up. And, and it is a, it's, a, it's an imbalance that's untenable for the long term. And that canard needs to be uh, dealt with politically. Next slide. Uh, some other things. Uh, you know, in each of the countries, the, 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 the guys suffering from the burns are, are probably the most are horrific because uh, often they're lost later because of uh, infection and so forth. There's, there, there are a lot of wounded that could really be, uh, have a, uh, all kinds of rehabilitative uh, treatment uh, uh, in any one of our countries. Uh, one of my pet projects is to try and find a support system for the uh, children of, uh, of seriously wounded and, and killed soldiers. Uh, when you go and, and visit a couple of their, and I, I've only done it with a couple, but the wife is basically left with a minimal pension because of the loss of the father. Uh, hope kind of goes out. And the Ministry of Defense doesn't have the money to, you know. Uh, and, and there's several thousand of those families. And, and, and reaching out to those kids, send them Christmas presents, uh, take, help uh, put, have them help to go to camp uh, or, or or at the beginning of the school year to get a little school package. Uh, and ones who are doing well, maybe teenagers, get some of them out of Ukraine and into, into education institutions. There's so much that could be done and would have such an impact on the, not only the families, but the guys who are serving, knowing that people care that when their family suffers for their courage and heroism, that somebody else will help pick up the flag. Uh, the Georgians had a, a company of guys, that some of the best fighters on the front, everybody will tell you that, they're the kind of company. Now they're trying to create it into an international brigade. Uh, there are Canadians, Australians, Americans, Germans, uh, Israelis, a bunch of guys uh, uh, out of 20 million diaspora. How many young, young men might be willing to go and join that unit? Uh, they have 100 guys now. Uh, that, that legion could, could have 10,000. Uh, does Ukraine necessarily need the manpower? No, they could probably do, that's not the critical part. The critical part is the symbolism. The symbolism. That there is a global community who are, is willing to not just talk, not just send money, but um, put their own, their own lives uh, online. Uh, lastly, we've been trying to tell the story um, it, it's impossible, very hard to, 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 to do a history project. Uh, by the way, I've never taken a single grievance from anybody in Ukraine. Uh, and I'm not going to. Uh, but if we do this history project to try and write up this story, uh, we need people to help do translations. Uh, we need people to, uh, we need airfares, because you can't go there and do that stuff. I, don't, I will not take a penny, but you just need airfares and stuff to do it. It's the only time I've ever made a pitch for anything, and I will not touch, touch the funds. By the way, those who are interested in helping the, uh, the children of the veterans uh, talk to uh, uh, Irka Naholnik, uh, she's also trying to organize it. That's it, thank you very much.